So we've got uh, so much to go through today, and I know you all are well rested, right? Because you got that extra hour of sleep last night, right? Amen? Amen. Right? Some of you live really well, and you say, yeah, I'm going to take advantage of that. I'm going to go sleep an extra hour. Some of you live it up, and you live another hour again. Uh, you stay awake. So, so I hope you're well rested because we got a lot to go through. And uh, Jesus loves me. What's the next words? This I, this I know. Jesus loves me. This I know. That's one of the most popular Christian anthems. The kids sang it last week. And here's what's crazy. It's gone all the way around the world. They sing it in all different languages all around the world. And I want to share with you a little story I came across this week. At the height of persecution of Christians in communist China... Even the simplest of messages were being censored by the government to try to squash the church in communist China. Well, the church there found a a fun little way to pass through the censorship without getting caught in their messages to one one another that escaped the, the attention of the censors. When they referred to themselves, they called themselves the, the this I know people are well. Jesus loves me, we are the this I know people. It's how they knew one another, it's how they identified the one another, that they were Christian. Oh, I'm the person who knows that Jesus loves me, the this I know people. You see, we are a people who get to be confident in the love of God towards us, amen? I can't hear you, amen? Yeah, you see... The disciples themselves were also getting to experience it face to face, the love of God in the person of Christ Jesus. They got to touch it. They got to hear it. They got to even see it on display in their following of the son of Jesus of Nazareth. Like, can you imagine what kind of friendship you'd have with Jesus as a person? What it would look like to follow him day after day? It's an incredible thing. Like, what a friendship. What a joy divine. What a fellowship. And yet, we're at the part in the Gospel of John where Jesus is like, yeah, I love you guys. I'm leaving. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm bailing. I'm getting out of here. Can you imagine having someone so close, so powerful, so prevalent say, yeah, I've, I've got to go. Where I'm going, you can't come. You'll be with me thereafter, but you won't see me for a while. Can you imagine how wrecked the disciples are at this moment? How confused they are? Wait, shouldn't you be ushering in the kingdom? No, he's going to his father. How can Jesus still love his disciples and leave them? You know... A lot of children hear that from parents who leave. I love you, but I've got to go. I'm leaving the family. I'm leaving you behind. They feel orphaned, no matter what you say. If, in fact, even Jesus mentions that the disciples probably felt orphaned. He said, I will not leave you orphaned. They felt as if they were being orphaned when Jesus says, I am leaving which means they are probably feeling the pain of the loss of a parental figure who would support them. Or, or actually, in the Greek, it was used of rabbis who would abandon their disciples. They would orphan their disciples, stripped of, of their master. So the question that the disciples are wrestling with right now is really, are we about to lose this love? Is this a lost love? Is he le- he's leaving us. How can, how can his love keep on enduring for us if he's not here with us anymore. So keep in mind where we are in the passage. We are in Jesus's farewell address where he's told them he's leaving and he's preparing them for his departure. It's the farewell passage. It's the longest section of red in your Bibles. So get well acquainted with it. He's preparing his disciples for his departure, and he's going to the greatest lengths to keep reminding them that he still loves them and how he's going to show them his love. And not only that, not only will his love endure, but he's telling them that it's going to grow, and they're going to know it even more after he's left. So 
we're going to focus on two main themes today. Loving Jesus and the Holy Spirit. First, real quick, I, we don't have time to walk through the text uh, verse by verse, so we're just going to go through and, and pick out two of the main things that get brought up in this text. The first thing, if, if you're not careful, you will bypass it. You won't notice it because you're caught up in some of the other really beautiful things that are said in this passage. But Jesus says the same thing four times. Three positively and one negatively. Verse 15, verse 21, verse 23, all in the positive. Verse 24 in the negative. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commands. If you love me, you will keep my commands. Verse, we see it in verse 15. If you love me, you will keep my commands. Verse 21, the one who loves me will keep my commandments. Verse 23, the same thing. In verse 24, he says it in the negative. He says, the one who doesn't love me will not keep my words. He also interchanges word for commands. You see in verse 15 and 21, he uses the word commands. And then in verse 23, he says, word. If you love me, you will keep my word. Logos. Everything that I've said. And if you don't love me, you won't keep my commandments or my word. Did you know that Jesus doesn't just ask for your trust? He asks for your love as well. I think, I think in a culture where we just say hellfire and brimstone, they're saving when Jesus, we invite them to trust Jesus as our confidence before God, but we don't invite them to, invite, to, to make Jesus as their primary love. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Faith and love for Jesus are most intertwined in Scripture. In fact, you, would almost, you could almost say that the meaning of love and all that that entails, and you add with it this understanding of trust, confidence, and hope, our faith, all of that equals this radical, loyal allegiance to Jesus. He has our trust and our hearts. Faith and love, so intertwined. And then we get here, he says that if you love me, you will, what is the verb he says there? Keep my command, my word. Guys, what does that mean? If you love me, you will keep, you'll hold on to, you'll, you'll keep my commands. Uh, if you've, uh, some of you have not ridden my truck with me yet, one of these days we'll take a ride in it. It's a beautiful truck. I, on my dashboard, have a really old Bible that I got in middle school. It's been sitting there for the last few years. I have not touched it once, except when I took a really hard turn and it swooshed off onto the left side. That's the only time I've touched it. But I keep it. I'm holding on. It's in my truck. I have it everywhere I go. Is that what Jesus has in view when he says, if you keep my commands? No. No, you can have a Bible and not be keeping Jesus' word, keeping his commands. Now, granted, I have a devotional Bible at home. This is my preaching Bible. That's my go-to Bible. If, if uh, My devotional Bible, it's all marked up. So I'm in it every day. Don't think I'm just not touching the Bible, right? Is keeping Jesus' command or, or keeping his word, getting, getting your favorite verse tattooed all the way across your chest, so that way everywhere you see it, you see the word? No, no. I, wouldn't, <laughs> I mean, that is a permanent keeping, if I would say, right? No, it's, it's not that sense. If, the Greek word there is tereo, tereo, and it's actually translated uh, in different, uh, different ways to mean to observe or to guard or to establish. It's the same verb that Jesus has used in the Great Commission. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe or obey. Or keep, that's the word there, all that I have commanded you. It's the same concept. There's this connection between our love for Christ and our full obedience of everything that he said. Right? Everything that he says. There's this linkage between loving Christ and obeying Christ. You can see it in 1 John 5, 3 when he says, this is love for God, to obey his commands. Guys, your love for Jesus 
will be fully evidenced in the way you obey his commands. Now, he doesn't here just simply single out a particular command. Hey, just obey this one, as we would probably like him to do. Just tell me which one I need to obey, and I'll obey that one. Don't give me all whatever, how many hundreds there are, right? No, he, he, he says, keep my commands, everything that he's commanded, and keep my word, all that he's spoken, all that he's said, everything he's told him to do, keep it, guard it, grasp it, obey it. Establish it in your life. He's describing a life committed to following him no matter where he leads. He's describing a person who has cast aside all concern except for obedience to Jesus. Guys, the only convincing evidence that we can point to in each other's lives and say, man, he really loves Jesus or she really loves Jesus is the way you live. It's the way you live. And by the way, Jesus isn't just asking us to do something that he himself is not willing to do. Hey, I want you guys to keep my word, but I'm not going to. No, he actually does it himself. Look at verse 31. He exemplifies the very behavior that he's asking of us, the very thing he asks of us. Verse 31, on the contrary, so that the world may know that I love the who? Who? The Father, I do as the Father commanded me. He's asking us to imitate him, to do what he does. The world knew Jesus loved the Father because he obeyed the Father's commands, especially the really hard ones, the difficult ones like, hey, how about you go die for sinners? Go get up on a cross. Let let the wicked people of the world crucify you. Die in their place. I love you, Dad. I'll go. Taking on the sins of the world, Jesus said, yeah, Dad, I'll I'll do it. I'll do it. Love for the Father produced joyful obedience in the Son. And when Hebrews 12 says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. The cross was his joy because he was obeying his Father. Brothers and sisters, the world will see our love for our Savior as genuine when we gladly choose to to obey the tough commands. You know, like the ones where we say, love your enemies, like pray for those who persecute you, (laughs) being patient. You know how hard that one is? Guys, when love is soft and safe and easy, that proves very little of the severity or the intensity of your love. Think about it this way. Who do we know loves his wife? An elderly man parading around with his healthy, beautiful, 20-something-year-old trophy wife on his arm? Or the elderly husband bathing and feeding his disoriented wife as she slowly loses her memory? They may both say that they love their wife. You definitely know one of them does. We're certain one of them does. Jesus shows us what it means to love through difficult obedience because the aroma of genuine love in the heart for Christ is obedient service. Now, one thing that we can often do in this conversation is confuse the root with the fruit. We can uh, confuse the effect with the cause, right? Uh, When you start struggling to obey, the solution for that is to just not obey more, right? The solution is love Christ more. Stir up your love for him more. Don't confuse the cause with the effect. Love doesn't equal obedience. Love produces obedience. 
Guys, having a sense of duty is one thing, right? Like we are, we're to be dutiful and, and yeah, God, I'm going I'm to agree with everything you say and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold fast to everything you said in this and I'm going to agree with it. It's one thing to have that kind of mentality. But when all your obedience is just out of a motive of duty, <sighs> I guess God said I got to do it. Okay, I don't care, I'll do it. Duty will not generate true obedience to Christ, and especially will never be able to generate joyful obedience. Only love for Christ can do that. Love for Jesus is to be the fuel. It's to be the motivation to obey all of his commands. Obedience has to flow out of a heart of love for Christ. Obedience without love is nothing more (laughs) In the pursuit of self-righteousness. Because if, if all we can do is look at these words, look at this correlation and, and think, well, maybe I can make Jesus happy if I do this one. Or maybe I, I won't make him so angry with me or disappoint him if I don't do this thing. As long as I don't mess up on this command. Then you're not actually obeying out of a heart of love for him. You're simply trying to earn his favor. And guess what? You already have it. It's already yours. Guys, I spent years, years bogged down in guilt and shame trying to continue to earn God's favor through years of struggling with sin and temptation. And I kept struggling and I kept thinking again and again that God was just Mad at me because I'm mad at me. I'm disappointed with myself, so God's disappointed with myself. But guys, the gospel, after it outs every single one of us as sinners in need of God's saving grace, it points our eyes to the cross. It points our eyes to God and said, he loved you first when you weren't worth loving. He went after you. And that cross means that where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Not to incentivize more sin, but to cover all sin. Guys, it can be an exhausting thing trying to live to get the favor of God in your life. Because nothing you do will ever be enough because your righteousness is supposed to see that of the Pharisees in order to see if you're ever going to earn that, but you know you can't ever do it. That's the whole point of why Jesus came, because his righteousness is enough. So if you want to grow in your obedience to Jesus, if you want to snuff out the flames of disobedience in your life, don't simply try harder. Mm Mm-mm. Stoke the flames of your love for Christ. Go into your own heart. Build up your affection, your love for Jesus. Because the antidote for disobedience isn't obedience, it's love. So here's the first part of this. Set your heart to loving Jesus. And I'm going to tell you why for the rest of the morning. But real quick, how how do you build up love for Jesus? How can you stoke the fire and the flames of love for Jesus in your heart? Well, there's several ways. The one that the Lord put on my heart this morning as I was preparing for this, you know what he said? What do you do whenever you want to put out a campfire? Separate the logs from themselves. You see, together, logs that are close together, that are each on fire, build the fire. But whenever you move the logs away from one another, each one of them will individually snuff out. Your love for Christ will build as you're with others who love Christ. Fire's contagious. Have you seen that? Find people who really seem to love Jesus. Get close to them.
Now, I told you I was going to tell you why you should really consider loving Jesus. I know all of you have, and that's why you're here. But let me show you what joys abound whenever you do. We're going to spend the rest of the morning talking about what happens when you do love Jesus, according to this passage. So first, if you love Jesus, here's one of the first things that the scripture says happens, that Jesus says here happens. You will be loved by the Father and the Son. Can you say loved by the Father and the Son? You can look in verse 21. The one who has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. Oh, okay, we were just talking about that, Jesus. Go on, please. And the one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I also will love him. Guys, this is a really hard truth that I think some of us kind of wrestle with and the world kind of wants to make us confused about. There are concentric circles to God's love, and not everyone is in the full measure of God's love. Yes, we can confidently say to the world, God loves them, God loves sinners, but there's a a new level of love that gets experienced when we respond to his love with love. There's a new level of love that gets experienced, and the hard truth is the world only experiences part of God's love. They'll experience the fullness of God's love when they respond to his love with their own. So he says, if you love me, you will keep my words. And if you love me, you will be loved by my father and loved by me. But he's leaving. He's leaving. How can can he keep loving us when he's not with us? Okay, that's going to keep pervading. Uh, What else happens when we love the son? Look at verse 21, the second part of it. Uh, My father will love him and I will love him. And will reveal myself to them. Oh, okay. So the second thing we see is if you love Jesus, you will know the Son. Say, you will know the Son? Oh, okay. So he says, I will reveal myself to him. Reveal meaning to make known, to help you to to get a fuller understanding of, to manifest. Well, hasn't he already been doing this? Yeah. So he's saying that there's there's more? There's, There's more? Coming? Like more to know? Whoa. But you're leaving. He's leaving. What? How is this going to work? How's, how's he going to let us know more of him if he's gone? It doesn't make sense. You see how confused I am and the disciples are at this point? Verse 23 tells us another third thing that happens when we love Jesus. Verse 23 says, that if you love Jesus, the Father and the Son come and make their home with you. What? Okay, so, so home is like the room. You know, in my father's house are many rooms. The dwelling place, the abiding place, the remaining place. This is saying in verse 23, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. God's abiding place is going to come and be with us. <laughs> but he's leaving. Again, he's leaving. How is this going to work? Okay. Jesus even acknowledges their confusion. Look at verse 27 and 28. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. Don't let your heart be troubled or fearful. That's the second time we've heard it already. You have heard me tell you. (laughs) I am going away and I am coming to you. (laughs) <laughs> what are we to do with that, Jesus? What? You're going and you're coming. Which one is it? I need to know. Remember in 1333, he says, I am leaving you. I'm going to a place that you cannot follow. And then verse 18, he says, I am coming to you. Is Jesus talking about the resurrection? Yeah, I think that's in view. But here's the problem. He ascends. He goes up into heaven. He doesn't stay here on earth anymore. Oh, okay. Is the resurrection of you? Maybe, but probably not. Is he talking about the end of days whenever the new city comes out of the new heaven or the heavens and creates a new earth and and, and God comes and dwells? Yeah, I think that's part of it. But that's like, it's been 2,000 years since we've had that. We really have been orphaned. But he said he wasn't going to orphan us in that time span. How is this supposed to work? Sorry, I'm a 
bit over dramatic right now. <sighs> I had plenty of sleep last night. That's what happened. How, how is all of this supposed to be true? How does all of this work? If, if we love Jesus, he loves us. The Father loves us. Uh, we'll get to know the Son more, and, and they'll come and they'll make it a home with us. Um, how does this work if he's leaving? Well, there's one more thing that happens when we love Jesus. And this answers everything. Verse 15 through 17. If you love me, you will keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. He is the spirit of truth. Ah. This is our first in-depth exposure to the person and the work of the third person of the Trinity, Holy Spirit. And we're going to talk, again, this is what happens when you love Jesus. You're given the Holy Spirit. You are given Holy Spirit. Guys, I don't know about you, but if you're anything like me, you grew up understanding that the Holy Spirit was like a battery pack you plugged in and energized all your godliness. But he wasn't a person. He was just like energy. That's all we got. He was this mysterious force. Like I actually understood the Holy Spirit to be more like the force from Star Wars than the person of the Trinity from the Bible. Right? In fact, I think most people do. Uh, the other day, I saw a clip from The Family Feud. Have any of you watched that show? You like that show, Family Feud? Yeah, yeah, fast money. They're playing that game at the end, right? And, and this lady comes up, and you fast money. They're supposed to have like five answers, sped it off real quick. And Steve Harvey's getting ready to answer, and she says, pause. I'm going to look like, oh, my gosh, I'm going to look so silly doing this. This is what she did. Pause, Steve Harvey. Holy Spirit, activate. Holy Spirit, activate. Holy Spirit. On TV, in front of everybody. It's like, Ah! Is the Holy Spirit a power that helps you think better so you can win $20,000? Is that what the Holy Spirit... (laughs) No! The Holy Spirit is not a force. He's a person. The Bible presents Holy Spirit as a person. Not just simply in the ways we hear about him in this text, but in the ways that he's described. He does personal things. He thinks. He speaks. He feels. He acts. And so real quick... Let me give you some ways that Jesus describes what the Holy Spirit is in our passage. First, the Holy Spirit. I hope you're taking notes because I've got, this is all a lot. The Holy Spirit is, first, given by the Father, asked for by the Son. Do you see that in verse 16? If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And if you love me, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor. Can you see just how much Jesus wants you to have God? He's like, hey, Dad, can you give them us? Uh, I I still want them to have us because we're the best thing that they've got. Holy Spirit, go. And they get them. This is the Dad's delight. This is our Father's delight is to send us his presence. So the Holy Spirit is given by the Father Asked for by the Son. In fact, there's other passages of Scripture where the Father sends the Spirit. There's other passages where it's the Son sends the Spirit. It's all crazy. They all just, apparently God really wants us to have Him. Have you noticed that yet? Right? Here's the second thing that we see the Holy Spirit is in this text. The Holy Spirit is another paraclete. Can you say paraclete? I thought so. Um, That's not in the English, that is in the Greek. Uh, He gives us another Counselor. Some of your translations say advocate, right? Or helper. Another counselor. Now, the word comforter, I don't mind it, uh, but when I think about a comforter, I think about like a bed quilt. Is that the Holy Spirit? Mm, I'm going to come wrap you in God's love. Maybe. Maybe that's what you need. Paraclete actually is more the word to call alongside is what it means in the Greek, to call alongside. So it's an encourager. It's an exhorter. Hey, come up here with me. That's what he's saying. 
we can see it used in different texts throughout the ancient world in the Greek. Uh, Leonidas, it was referred to him in summoning alongside his armies of, to the, uh, the, of Thebans to the war. We see it in a judicial sense when someone comes to a witness and to testify to, to the aid of the one involved. We also see even its earliest use, that it's to encourage uh, sailors cheering one another on in a storm. <laughs> The Holy Spirit is the one who comes. He's coming alongside to encourage, to help, to strengthen, to advocate for us. And we see this other description of what Holy Spirit is. Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth. Can you say Spirit of truth? Verse 17. He is the Spirit of truth. Not just that what he speaks is true, he is the breath of it. He is the breath of truth into us. So when we're caught in the lies and in the deceptions of the world and of Satan, breathe. God breathes his spirit and truth reigns. Then we get to this next passage here. I, am I going crazy? Do y'all hear that? Okay. I'm sorry, I was like, there's this ling lingering ring in my left ear. I was wondering if y'all noticed it, and I was like, I I'm about to die. Is okay, so it wasn't me. I'm sorry. Whew. All right. Let's keep working. The Holy Spirit. We're talking about the Holy Spirit. I was like, is that the Holy Spirit? Just kidding. No, he doesn't sound like that. Lastly, we find out that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus. He is the Spirit of Jesus. Look in verse 17. This is what confused me at first, and then I got it. The world is unable to receive the Spirit of truth because it doesn't see him or know him. But you know now, you currently know the Spirit of truth because he, present tense, right now, remains with you and will be, future tense, in you. Huh. So they must have the Spirit of truth with them at that moment. In, in, verse, uh, in, in, in verse 16, or seven, yeah, verse 16, he said, another counselor. I will give you another counselor. And in this context, you can't help but notice that that, that just means that it's, it's in referencing one that the disciples already have, a.k.a. the one who's departing. And when I leave, you're getting another. Another's holy, you're getting another me, basically, the Holy Spirit. And so that's all the Holy Spirit is and so much more, but this is just in this passage. Let's really quick run into what the Holy Spirit does according to this text. First, of course, if he's a paraclete, if he's a counselor or an advocate, what does he must do? He must counsel, he must advocate, he must encourage. Oh man, do we need that. We need, we need that voice of truth to be speaking to us, and we need our ears tuned to his advocacy, tuned to his counsel, tuned to the truth he speaks. He's available for us. That's one thing he does. Here's the second thing he does. According to verse 26, that the Holy Spirit teaches us all things. You see that in verse 26? But the counselor of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things things. In other words, he's our rabbi. If the disciples had Jesus as theirs, we have Holy Spirit as ours. Guys, this is a really good thing because I don't know if you've noticed yet in the Gospel of John, but if you were to read through several of the Gospels, you would find out uh, that, that um, uh, the disciples, uh, J Joseph used this in the membership class the other day, the disciples are doofus heads. Was that the, yeah, that was the word? Yeah, they're, they're pretty much doofus. They mess up a lot. Think about it. How many times did they have to go to Jesus and be like, uh, what did that parable mean? Right? And, and, and why are we doing this? And, and, and why would you go there? And where are you going? <laughs> right? They're still always asking these questions. They still need a teacher. We still need a teacher for us to be disciples of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit's role in our lives today is to teach us so that we understand Here's this passage I read in 1 Corinthians 2 the other month. We have not received the spirit of the world, 
but the Spirit who comes from God, so that we may what? Understand what has been freely given to us by God. Now, one thing I want to clarify is that oftentimes uh, there's this concern that, that when we hear from the Holy Spirit that we're getting like this new revelation that's not in Scripture. The answer is no. The Holy Spirit doesn't actually speak anything new. He confirms to us and speaks to us the Word of Christ that is old. So anytime you hear from Holy Spirit, it's like a, it's like a used car, right? It's new to you, but that thing ain't new, okay? So, so that's, he's not coming to speak new revelation per se. He's confirming to us the full revelation of Christ that's already given to us. Last, well, here's another one. Holy Spirit, what else does he do? He reminds us of Jesus' words. Ha, huh. and all God's forgetful children said, are we not forgetful? How many of you know what you did this morning for breakfast? How many of you have read through this book like three times and you get back through it and you're like, I don't remember that. We're prone to forget. We need God's Holy Spirit to bring to our remembrance his word. And any time you have that joy, that gift of a, of a remembrance of God's word, it's Holy Spirit doing that work in you. Now here's the last thing the Holy Spirit does in this text that just, it's the most amazing thing. The Holy Spirit dwells in those who love Jesus. I think, I think this is the best part. This is the most amazing thing, and I, I still don't fully grasp it, and, and I, don't, I still don't think I deserve it. I don't think we deserve it. That God who dwells on high would be willing to establish the his presence residing in us. It amazes me. Look at verse 20. Well, actually, at the end of verse 17, we already read it. But you do know him, the Holy Spirit, because he remains with you and will be what? In you. And then look down at verse 20. This one is the most, oh, just amazing. On that day, basically on the resurrection day and, and potentially after the ascension and the, the coming of the Holy Spirit. You will know that I am in my Father, you are in me, and I am in you. Right? So I've got a way to try to illustrate this. Uh, by the way, every illustration that you try to use for the Trinity will always fall short. So, so don't take this too far, especially because it's Tupperware, and I don't call our God a Tupperware set, okay? But... Think of it this way. The first thing that he tells us is what? He's the son. And where is he? He is in. Well, there goes the Holy Spirit. The Father. We've already heard this several times. He said that when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you love me, you love the Father. So to love Jesus, you're loving the Father. Amen? Now, what do you say next? I am in my Father. And you are in me. Here's you. You see, you see it says you. Can y'all read that in the back? Okay. Where did he say we are? Oh. Okay. Probably should have gotten quick release. You are in the sun. Amen. Well, where's the sun? He's in the father. Oh. Where'd you go? You're in there. Guys, Romans 6 tells us that, that we have been baptized into Jesus. The word baptism means immersed. We have been placed into Jesus, the Son. And in Colossians 3, he says that your life is now hidden with Christ. Are you getting a little closer picture? You know, you know when we fill this thing up and we dunk somebody in it and says, uh, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? When Jesus tells us to baptize in the name of the Father and the Holy Spirit, does that mean that we're just using words, those words, whenever we put somebody in water and come back out? No. Admit this. You are being placed into the life of Christ who is in the Father. Now, 
He didn't stop there. He said, I am in the Father. Okay, check. You are in me. Oh, there we are. Check. Well, then, what else? He say, I am in you. He said, I am in you. All right. I told you, quick release would have been so much easier. We're stubborn. We don't open that well. Holy Spirit fills each and every one of us, comes into our lives. All that God said the Holy Spirit is, all that he does, taking up residence in you. Right? You know how we were just singing earlier uh, that you've got a lion inside of your lungs, so get up and praise the Lord. That, that it's your breath in our lungs. That's because this dude's in here. That's because we got Holy Spirit inside of us. He's the lion. He's the breath. Holy Spirit means pneumos. It's breath. He is the breath of God, the very essence, the presence of God dwelling in us. So the Holy Spirit takes up residence in us. We take up residence in Christ. This is how we get to come before the Father because his righteousness is who God sees I forgot all these lids. I'll just throw them in there. Now, Augustine, and I actually, this doesn't mean anything for me to agree with Augustine, but Augustine believes that the Holy Spirit is the Trinity dwelling in you because he is the Spirit of God. And God said, Jesus said that if you love me, my Father and I will come and set up our home with you. And by the way, do you remember how long... Jesus said that the Holy Spirit was going to be with us. At the end of verse 16, who's the quick on the draw? Pull it out. Verse 16, he will be, he will be with you for a what? Forever. He's not leaving. Hey, so, so what happens when we love Jesus? When, when our hearts are given to genuine love for Jesus? Uh, can we see ourselves anymore? No, because all we see is our life caught up in God. And can't you see how much God wants to be involved in your life? And can you not see, actually, on the better, can you not see how much God wants you to be caught up in his life? Guys, I don't know about you. Have, you. have you ever wished? Have you ever wished that Jesus was sitting next to you and you could just have a face to face conversation with him? You could, you could talk to him about your day. You could tell him just some of the things you're struggling with. Ask him to help make sense of it all. Ask him face to face just for the, the patience that I need when I get home. Or, or anything, like wouldn't that be an amazing thing where Jesus is just like right, right here. The Holy Spirit is to be exactly that for us. We have available to us that relationship with God because of the Holy Spirit now. Just as Jesus comforted and strengthened and encouraged his disciples, you and I can be comforted and strengthened and encouraged by his spirit that dwells within you. Because I, I just got to ask you, like, have you truly actually embraced this beautiful promise? Or is it still just a theological truth to you? Because when you, when you view yourself as so caught up in the life of God, doesn't that make better sense of what it means to pray without ceasing? Well, he's everywhere around you and within you, so every time you talk to him, he's right there. Life caught up with God. You may be able to theologically discuss this concept 
and the filling of the Holy Spirit. But can you honestly, genuinely say that the Holy Spirit's role in your life is similar to the presence of Jesus in the lives of his disciples? Because, brothers and sisters, the same relationship Jesus had with his disciples, we are to have with the Holy Spirit. And it's available, and it's free, all because Jesus went to the cross. He bore our sin and our shame. He gave us his righteousness. He died, he rose, he reigns, and he's asked his dad to send us their spirit. And the Holy Spirit fills you. Can you see everything that Christ has won for you? The life that he's secured for you? So at this time, I, I, realize, I realize where we're at, but how about we start lunch together? And we take the communion together as a church family. Because after talking about everything that, the, that, that, that we have been given in, in our responding to God's love with our own love, being caught up in the life of Christ who is in the Father, who he himself is also in us, all of that was simply purchased because Jesus gave his life for us. He poured out his blood he offered up his body 